I'm Dr. Brad Hafford, archaeologist and economic anthropologist. Welcome to Coin Corner, where I take a look at two coins from the past to see what they can tell me about the authority that issued them and the people who used them. My examples are not always in great condition, but even the wear patterns can tell us something, at least that they circulated to fulfill their primary purpose as currency. I've chosen examples that are connected in some way so that we can also learn something in the comparison. In this case, I'm looking at two coins that circulated in parts of Africa in the early 20th century. Both are bronze, but they were issued by different colonial powers. We'll begin by looking at the obverse of the first coin. The obverse, or head side, often carries a portrait of an important person from the country. But here, we don't have a head. We have something that might sit atop a royal head, a crown looks a bit more like a church than a crown, since it has a cross at the top and what appear to be windows or doors all around, but the outer shape and the ribbon that streams from behind gives it away as a crown, specifically the Imperial State Crown of Germany. This crown was designed in 1871 to reflect the unification of German states into empire. It was based on the crown of the Holy Roman Emperor, and a model of the German version was made but the final was never carried out or worn. Instead, the design was used as a symbol on things like this coin up until the end of the German Empire in 1918. Even the model of the crown disappeared in the Second World War and has never resurfaced. The coin is a bit worn on the high spots, and so the imagery on the crown is a little hard to see. The small Christian cross at the top and the large one in the center window, flanked by two smaller, are obvious. But at the sides, we can just make out the Reichsadler, or Imperial Eagle, each one facing in towards the cross. This Reichsadler, like the crown, was often used as a symbol of the empire. So the imagery on the obverse of the coin does what it should, identify the issuer. Even though the issuer was Imperial Germany, the coin itself circulated in a part of Africa that is now mainly known as Tanzania, though it included Burundi and Rwanda at the time. The upper legend tells us this as it identifies the region of the coin, only in the German language. It reads Deutsch Ostafrika, which is German East Africa. Up until the end of the First World War, Germany had colonial interests in Africa, with Tanzania being the primary area they controlled. This is on the eastern side of the continent, and so it was known as German East Africa to distinguish it from German West Africa, which was Cameroon. Togo, and a few other small areas along the West African coast. The date of the coin is clearly struck at the bottom, 1907. This type of coin was only struck from 1904 to 1913. Turning the coin over its vertical axis, we see a smooth edge and that the coin is relatively small. It measures 20 millimeters and weighs 4 grams. The reverse emphasizes the circulating value, as is true for most coins. Here, we see that its value was one heller, which had originally been half a finnig in 13th century Germany. That coin faded out as virtually worthless, but the unit was brought back in East Africa to represent one one-hundredth of a rupee, the designated silver currency of the region. Below the denomination, we see the letter J. This is the mint mark, showing that the coin was struck in Hamburg. The mint at Hamburg is very old indeed, having begun in the 9th century. Surrounding the denomination is a wreath, probably of laurel, though it could be olive. Laurel wreaths denote victory, while olive branches designate peace. But what is victory or peace in colonies dominated by an empire? Let's now compare it to another East African coin, again issued by a colonial empire and circulating in a broader region, primarily Kenya, but including Zanzibar and parts of Uganda and Tanzania. We start with the reverse this time, though the most obvious characteristic of this coin is the central hole, which can be seen on either side. Imperial powers often considered the parts of Africa and Asia that they seized to be rather primitive. They often believed that the people in these regions needed a hole in their coins, since they didn't wear Western-style clothes with pockets. The hole allowed coins to be tied together and hung from a belt or garment. At other times, the powers issued hold coins because currencies such as earlier coins or shells circulating in the area before colonial takeover had holes in them. 
And so the new powers wanted to make coins that seemed familiar enough to create trust in their circulating value. Faith is one of the only things that keeps money flowing, after all. The denomination is stated on the reverse, as is typical, but in this case it says only 10, with no units mentioned. It also states the area of circulation, East Africa, here on the reverse rather than on the obverse. In this case, the language represented is English, and the year is 1936. There's also a design flanking the central hole. This design is of stacked elephant tusks, which at the time were seen as a resource, though now it is quite distasteful, as it means the destruction of many of the noble animals for their ivory. The ivory trade was big business in the 19th century and continued largely unabated until the enforcement of the CITES Agreement in 1975. As we flip the coin on its vertical axis, we see the raised and darted rim and the smooth edge. This coin is larger than the first at 30.6 millimeters and weighs more than twice as much at 10.9 grams. The obverse reveals the issuing authority in a similar way to the German coin. That is, it displays a crown, though of a different sort. This is the king's crown of Great Britain. It too has a cross atop, though thicker, in a Maltese style on top of an orb. It's also worn on the high points, and the fleur-de-lis that we can see is perhaps considered to be French by most people, but the lily symbol itself is not solely French. It tended to symbolize the imperial power was claiming divine right to rule. The king who is claiming right to rule on this coin, Edward VIII, did not rule long at all, less than one year. In fact, the East African colonial coins are the only ones ever struck with his name. 1936 was known as the year of three kings, since George V was king until his death in January. Then his eldest son, Edward, took the throne, but he abdicated to December, and his younger brother then became King George VI. Edward's name here, as was tradition on British coins, is shown in Latin, including a V instead of a U in Edwardus. His titles are abbreviated as they're too long to write out in full. Rex et end imp means king in flight of Great Britain and emperor of India. He left the throne to marry an American woman, however, and George VI would be king throughout the Second World War. At the bottom is the denomination, this time in full, 10 cents. In Britain itself, pounds, shillings, and pence were used, but in Africa, they designated shillings and cents, adopting a decimal system. Here, 100 cents rather than 12 pence equal to shilling. A 10 East African cent coin, then, was roughly equivalent to one penny in Britain. A ribbon-like flourish flanks the central hole, and the raised rim with darts is clear on this side as well. So what do these two coins tell us about East Africa from 1907 to 1936? Africa was caught in the intricate web of colonization by Western imperial powers throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th. These powers fought with each other essentially for the ability to abuse the locals and strip resources from the terrain. We can't know what would have happened without colonization, but it is important to recognize the many negative effects it had. Coins like these went some way, perhaps to regularize trade, but only in a Western manner. There had been exchange before the Western powers arrived, and it functioned well enough for the region. Colonial powers made African ports more connected with world ports and this expanded trade greatly. It created monetary benefit, but only for the people who controlled the ports, and these were the Western powers, not the local people, for the most part. It meant an ever-increasing push to harvest Africa's resources, and precious metals, gems, and ivory were taken out of the country. It also drew African nations into Western wars. When the colonial powers of Britain and Germany declared war on each other in the First World War, they called the colonies and its people into the struggle. Many native Africans were pressed into service and died in a war waged not by them nor in their interest. The end of the war saw a rearrangement of colonial control, but not the freedom of the colonies. Britain received a mandate in 1922 to control the former German colony of Tanzania. And so both of the coins that we see here circulated in the same general region, but the British coin in 1936 extended over a larger area than the German one of 1907. Colonialism continued into the Second World War, again seeing many Africans pulled into combat. Although Germany no longer had colonies, France had many, 
and France fell to Germany early in the war. This put the French Vichy government, allied with the Third Reich Germany, in charge of much African territory. Colonial coinage is interesting for its imagery and convoluted history, but one of its main purposes today should be to remind us of all the problems that were inherent in the flawed system of colonial control. I hope you enjoyed looking at these coins with me. I'm Dr. Brad Hafford. Join me again next time for Coin Corner, part of my series, Money Talks.